So um, I'm going to start by giving an overview of what CoreSight is, um, what our solution for on-chip debug and trace is, and uh, then Matthew is going to take over and talk about what we're doing to push this, support this into the Linux kernel. So CoreSight is developed to, to solve the problem of understanding what goes on on one of these, which is a, a system on chip. So we want to observe what's going on, capture information that allows us to debug problems. So to simplify, we've got several cores, probably talking over some kind of on-chip interconnect, to memory, to various off-chip peripherals. And what we do is we put some on-chip instrumentation onto this. It's mostly non-invasive. We hook up the cores to something we called ETM, Embedded Trace Macro Cell, and we funnel this trace into various trace collectors. Um, so we have something we call an ETB, Embedded Trace Buffer, which is a piece of dedicated memory on the chip, uh, typically something like 8K to 32K of dedicated memory. Um, we have a component that sends trace off chip um, to an external trace capture unit. Um, this is very useful on things like developed boards, prototyping boards. It tends to be difficult on production devices because simply because of lack of pins and lack of external sockets. And then more recently we have something called an embedded trace router which funnels the trace back to um, the main system interconnect and, and there, for, there to main memory. And obviously that is going to be slightly more invasive in the sense that it's right into memory, but it allows you to capture a lot more trace. And we also have something called an STM, which is a software trace macro cell, which is something that actually slaves off the main interconnect, acts as a peripheral and allows you to inject trace into the main trace subsystem. So that's all, that's our system for collecting trace. So the core instruction trace is what I'm going to be mostly focusing on to start with. Um, this generates a lot of trace when, when running at full speed, We're talking about one gigabit to 10 gigabit per, sec per cycle, sorry, per second, um, depending on clock frequency, um, trace options, the amount of branches in the code, various um, mileage may vary factors there, but roughly that order of speed. And then, as I mentioned, the software instrumentation is something that's purely under software control. Software simulates this to write messages into the trace stream. We can also hook up that STM module to hardware events to collect random signals from across the chip. I'm not going to talk more about that because that's very, very specific to individual chips. Um, we, a lot of our partners put their own devices onto the core site fabric, so things like video controllers, DSPs. Um, we don't know a lot about what they do with it, but ultimately they, they can trace, they can use that trace in their own tools. So some of these um, inputs to core site are really only for sort of the development by the SOC designer. But I'm going to focus on things that are useful for all application developers and kernel developers. So the trace sources are then multiplexed into this trace fabric and they are identified by a unique 7-bit identifier attached to the trace source and obviously when you decode it you have to demultiplex it at the other end. So ETM is our solution for core trace, for tracing instructions. ETM has got a very general state machine. It can be enabled by programming it up with a particular configuration and it then switches itself on or off autonomously. So it can be set up to switch itself on when it sees particular events, say particular um, performance events, um, matching addresses. It can be set up with filters for address ranges. It could trace only user space or only kernel space or, or both. Uh, it can filter on context ID, um, which is a special register in the ARM architecture which might or might not be set up to do uh, to, to track the um, process ID. And it can also um, be filtering, it can also filter on BMID, which is the virtual machine identifier. 
to program the ETM to change the configuration, you have to deactivate it. But you can do this um, you know, in, a, in a running system. So this is not something you have to configure only at boot time. You can configure this um, you know, from within Linux. Each core has its own ETM, so all of these can be running independently. So ETM generates trace into the trace stream. This is very highly compressed because of the rate of the, uh, the cores. I mean, logically, we want to trace every single instruction, get every piece of information about that instruction. You can imagine if we're, if we're tracing a 3 gigahertz core, there's no way we can push that into a, a trace buffer and, and get a reasonable amount of trace. And there'd be major problems with getting it off chip as well. So what we do is we compress the trace stream down. Um, often, we, in the more recent high performance cores, we actually compress it down so there's just one bit per conditional branch telling you which way it went. So it's a bit like following a set of um, street directions. You know, take the second left and the third right. Um, to reconstruct the instruction stream, you actually need a map of, of the, the code. So you can then follow through the code and work out where each conditional branch is going to take you. So this, this is kind of critical to decoding trace, and this is one of the issues with um, decoding trace on, on a sort of complex dynamic system like Linux. For embedded trace, where you've got everything in ROM, it's much easier. But where you've got Linux, you've got a kernel, you've got um, loadable kernel modules, you, you may have dynamic trace points which patch the code to replace knobs with branches. Um, and then you've got all the complexity of, of user space as well. So you've got multiple address spaces, You've got things being loaded into address spaces. Um, so generally, to decode trace successfully, we need some kind of side channel that captures events saying what's gone into each address space. Um, there is this context ID register that I mentioned. This can be set up in the kernel using existing options um, to, to track the address space identifier. And this means that you don't need to track separately when you're switching address spaces, so when, you're, when your scheduler is switching from one address space to another, you don't need to track that um, because that's tracked in the context of your register and this comes out in the trace stream. If you're not using that register, you do have to track, um, you do need to have some separate record of when you switch between address spaces. So, what, what is ETM useful for? Well. It's, it's useful for performance investigations because it's non-invasive. Um, you can, you can, if you're looking at performance of some particular routine, you can use ETM filtering just to capture the, the trace for that routine or, or that area of memory. Um, you could randomly sample. So you could, you could capture lots of different samples and stitch them together. Um, you could use that to build up a, a, a more accurate profile than you could with um, software sampling or interrupt driven sampling. And you could use it as a kind of flight recorder to um, capture trace, which you then upload to some analysis tool. And in fact, you can, you can enable trace right from boot time. So you could even have your bootloader switch on the rolling trace, have that continuously captured into a trace buffer, totally unknown to the kernel. And then as soon as some crash happens, some crash handler stops the trace and uploads it to your analysis tool. Obviously, there'll be a, a power impact from enabling this background trace, but the, the performance impact is minimal to none. So the strengths of hardware trace, hardware instruction trace, it's non-invasive. Um, I should qualify that by saying if you're routing the trace through to your system RAM, it's going to be very, very slightly invasive. Um, it's not going to go through your main um, processor caches. It's going to go straight to RAM, but obviously it will be contending for system interconnect bandwidth. Um, you can enable it all the time. You can um, program it to um, autonomously enable and disable itself without it, uh, waking up the core to do that. Um, and particularly, you can trace through interrupt disable code. I mean, the, the, the process of trace feature doesn't care about disabling interrupt something. It just continues to trace. So you can trace when you take exceptions, uh, when you disable interrupts, when you return from exceptions. You basically get a complete picture of what the core is doing. 
and you can trace all cores at the same time. So you, you, you can trace all the activity on the cores and then correlate them by means of the global timestamp that we use for trace. So challenging challenges are that it can be tricky to decode on a dynamically, dynamically changing system where code is being loaded into memory. And that, that can be solved by tracking what the uh, address maps are. So that introduces a slight extra invasiveness. The other challenge is that simply the amount of data that's being collected. So um, at 10 gigabits a second per core, with systems now scaling up to 16 cores, 48 cores, even beyond that, that can put limits on how much trace you can capture. So what sort of things can you see? Um, it's a bit fuzzy, but you can possibly see that we've got some timestamps, some cycle counts. Um, this is essentially exactly the same piece of kernel code on two different cores. Um, so the core on the left, um, we can see that we've got cycle counts for every instruction. You can actually see it stepping through each instruction, and um, it's got a cycle count attached. So this is instruction level trace. Um, this is what we have on some of our perhaps lower end cores, which aren't scaled to such a high clock frequency. We have instruction level trace where you can get a cycle count for every instruction. On the right, we have a, a much higher scaling core where we only get the cycle count on basic block boundaries. So you can see that when we um, take a branch, we update the cycle count. So we're basically getting basic block times. And this gets us, at the very least, it gets us basic block timings for um, code, irrespective of whether interrupts are disabled. This, this is accurate times, as you would see when you run the benchmark without any kind of tracing enabled. So it's totally non-invasive. So we can use that to construct a kind of cycle accurate profile. So this is a timeline of two cores. Um, we're actually trying out a new kernel modification here. I think we, we did something like um, apply RCU to the shade clock routine. So we, we've got two different cores and we want to see the effect of this kind of kernel modification on these cores. So um, you can probably see that they're executing exactly the same kernel code path, but we're collecting um, trace for both of them, and you can see there's some sl slight time differences. And we've highlighted the trace to show some critical performance events like um, memory barriers. So the red, the red blobs are memory barriers. And you can see, um, if you look closely, that this... Um, actually, I'll blow it up. You can see that these um, have an impact on the latency or the, the execution time of different basic blocks. And as I say, this is totally non-invasive. It's um, running through interrupt-disabled code. This is exactly the sort of performance you'd see. So if, if you're running something like Hackbench and you, you, you want to understand the effect of your modification, you don't have to just do it empirically. You can actually get a complete trace of your, of your kernel. So STM is the other useful component that hooks up to the Corsite trace subsystem. This is a memory mapped trace generator, so you can write messages to this. Um, so the, the, the message generation area is kind of separate from the, the normal memory mapped peripheral programming area that all these core site components have. This is a big block of memory. You can map it into different address spaces a page at a time. So each address space can get its own page of STM stimulus window, and it can then use that to generate instrumentation messages in a very low overhead way. Obviously, it's slightly invasive in the sense that you're storing to memory, but you get a timestamp for free, and you don't have any effect on your cache. So compared to reading the system timer and writing it into a ring buffer, it's actually less invasive. And of course, it's going into the same trace collection fabric as all the, the process of trace. So here's our kind of overall architecture for how this works together in Linux. So you've got, on the left, you've got the, the sort of low-level trace 
component programming framework that Matthew's going to talk about. This is the uh, device drivers that talk to these components, program them up, make sure they're all um, feeding into the trace collection buffers, lets you read out the trace collection buffers. Then on the right, we've got the a software that drives the STM component, and this then allows applications and the kernel to use this as a way to generate um, software instrumentation mes messages. And you can see there, right on the right, that we can punch through a window into this memory mapped area right up into user space so that user space can write messages without any kind of transition into the kernel. So where can we capture trace? So this is a kind of scaled picture of our options. So in the past, we've typically had an on-chip ETB, which is relatively small. I mean, it's, it's, it's there for what it needs to do. It's useful if you need it. But if you, if you want to capture a lot of trace, our technology has generally been to use an off-chip trace capture unit, which offers you many orders of magnitude bigger capture size. What we're starting to offer, or starting to see more on chips now, is capture domain memory. I've given there an example of a four megabyte buffer. But of course, you can scale this to any size you want. So if you, if you are running a high-end system and you've got a spare gigabyte, then actually you, you're, you, you can begin to become competitive with a, an off-chip capture unit. And of course, you haven't got the hassle of finding some pins on your chip package and finding a spare connector on your device to route this into an off-chip capture unit. So um, I mentioned that some of these things are very high bit rate, and this sort of works together with the size of the capture buffer to determine how much trace you can capture. Um, so on, on the right-hand extreme, you've got the ETM trace, which is up to sort of 10 gigabits a second at the, at the very top end. And you can see that if you were to capture that into an ETB, um, you can capture about 10 microseconds at most. But even that is useful. I mean, we have used that to solve real kernel performance problems that were simply defeating all other approaches. So we've solved problems for customers in, in Linux kernel performance using trace into an ETB. It just, you just need to be selective about where you're capturing and use the, the filtering options. Um, if you start tracing to RAM, then obviously you can, you can grow um, to capture more trace, longer trace. And when you're using STM, well, the, the trace bit rate is determined by how many messages you're pushing out, so really your mileage completely varies. So RAM is starting to come in. That's, that's allowing us to, to increase the size of the amount of trace we capture. Another thing that we're starting to see interest in is um, trace over functional interfaces. So this is reusing interfaces like PCIe, USB, possibly others, to as an alternative way to push trace off chip to an external capture unit. And this just basically makes things more practical, allows it to be deployed on more devices. So we should see some of these limitations kind of evaporate. So we think actually the opportunities for core site trace are becoming more, and you should, you should actually, it's actually making it more accessible to the average kernel developer um, and application developer. And what we'd love to see is a kind of standard generic um, software infrastructure in Linux that embraces our core site trace infrastructure and our various architectural, uh, the other architectures trace infrastructures in the same way that the, the perf subsystem embraces the various architecture specific hardware performance counters and makes them usable to, to developers. So I'll, I'll hand over to Matthew who can talk about how we're pushing all support for all this into the kernel. Okay, so I'll explain to you everything and the wonders that CoreSight is. So um, since March, uh, actually the journey of CoreSight started way before that, actually two or three years ago at, at Lanero, but for various reasons uh, and priorities, um, other things have uh, come into play. But since March, uh, there's a group at Lanero, including myself, that have started looking at CoreSight and working on it full time. 
Um, what we wanted was to, uh, as Al mentioned, take all of this, uh, this power and make a standard architecture in the kernel, at least a base foundation so that people can start building from. Um, so uh, back in 2012, Code Aurora published a very extensive framework that received um, a lot of positive comments uh, when it was first RFC'd. Unfortunately, the people behind it never had any uh, time, the bandwidth, uh, to address the comments that were made. So uh, what we did is decide to start from that address the comments and publish it. So we've been through seven iterations of that, uh, the last of which came out two weeks ago. Uh, unfortunately, it's the merge wind rule right now, so nothing has been done on that front, uh, but we're very hopeful that we'll be able to get in um, sooner rather than later. So um, right now, uh, the framework supports everything that Al talked about with regards to uh, IP blocks. So we have ETM from 3.3 to 3.5, PTM 1.0, PTM 1.1, um, uh, an eight port funnel, eight to one, non-reconfigurable replicator. Uh, there's room also in there for replicators that might be configurable. That driver will be coming subsequently. Um, with regards to syncs, ETB, we talked about that. TPIU, which makes a bridge between uh, what's on the chip and an offsite trace collection and a trace memory controller. So all of these devices right now are part of the framework that we have published. Um, support that is laid to come in, uh, STM, CTI, so cross trigger interface and software trace macro self. Uh, we decided to delay these uh, a little bit um, with just because uh, they are probably going to um, gather a lot of conversation, a lot of opinions on how to proceed in order to implement these drivers, and we did not want to uh, uh, bring the attention on other things than the framework itself for now. Uh, some of the highlights of the framework, everything is uh, driven via the device tree, so that way we can take uh, any type of board that has uh, core site or that is core site enabled, uh, make the specification through the device tree, and based on what is found there, the framework will pull the right drivers, configure it properly, so that there is a minimum amount of code required. Um, right now, we've ported it to about four platforms without having to rewrite a single line of code. So all of this support is done via the device tree. Um, configuration is done via SysFS. Um, we toyed with uh, sending it to debugfs, but Craig asked us to uh, take it out of there, so we did so. Um, one thing that is pretty interesting is that we have decoupled the power state of the CPU with the, uh, the trace collection uh, IP itself. So it's not because the processor itself is down uh, that you cannot uh, configure uh, the ETM or the PTM. Also true uh, for tracing uh, uh, power up or power down scenarios. Um, so that way, um, the state of your CPU does not impact what is being traced and how it's being traced. Um, we also have configuration for multiple sources, multiple sinks, so we can, as if the PAT is present in the architecture, it is able to configure it via uh, the framework that we have. There's no constraint on uh, how many sources can be configured and how many sinks uh, can be enabled at the same time. Um, Al talked about metadata. This is something that we have to iron out. Uh, the framework also supports uh, the beginning of collection of information for uh, uh, trace decoding. Okay, so the code, everything is on Linero. Everything we do is public. There's nothing hidden. It's all, all in the open, okay? Uh, the code is always based on the latest and greatest kernel, so always uh, on the last re release. Um, once you have the code, everything is under driver's core site. Uh, and if you do a make menu config, you'll find a configurables in uh, kernel hacking uh, core site tracing support. So under there, you'll find um, support for all the components that are generic. And that's important to mention. Uh, what we did is um, use the specification that is published by ARM, 
uh, the drivers for those. Now, Coresight is something that is heavily extensible. So we've dealt with companies that have modified the IP blocks, which is fine, right? There's no problem there, except that we haven't uh, concentrated on developing drivers for those. The idea of the framework is to reuse the whole Coresight infrastructure, even if you have a component in the architecture that might be proprietary or that might have been enhanced, right? There's no reason to rewrite the whole affair just because a simple enhancement has been done to uh, one of the IP block in the core site architecture. Um, right, so all of our initial, all, all of our early year submissions are also present in our Git tree. And uh, if you Google for uh, core site framework and drivers, you'll also see all the comments that people have made and why we have, or maybe why things that are there today, how they got to that point. Uh, documentation, I have tried to explain that what we've done as clearly as possible. Everything is in the patch set under the documentation. Uh, the bindings are there as well. Uh, we follow the graph bindings that are, uh, that came in um, from the video for Linux. So that was an interesting and a positive enhancement that came from people uh, in the mailing list. Um, with regards to uh, information, I did two sessions at Connect. You'll find a reference at the end of the presentation. So there's an introduction session and there's another session on how to port components to CoreSight and how um, some of the, the challenges that we have to deal with. Right, so that's all in there. And um, Al and I um, did an experimentation where we took uh, the, um, uh, the compression capabilities out of DS5 um, and did um, basically we were able to decompress the code or trace decompression out of command line and all of these instructions on how to do that uh, are there also um, in a post that or um, on the Linera website there's also a post that I did for core dump which is one of the the, um, uh, the blog that we have at Linero. so uh, there's a fair amount of information that is out there, published by Linero, and also a lot and a lot of documentation on Info Center uh, that is coming from ARM. So what is next? Uh, our priority is definitely to, definitely to concentrate on the framework. Uh, um, this, is, this is what we want uh, right now. There's no, there's no way uh, or there's no need or, or point in trying to go further if we don't have a framework in place. Uh, we're dealing with, right now, we are working with Qualcomm and TI to bring support for boards, uh, for Corsair on those boards. STM32 uh, and ARM V8, we are actively working on that as well. And in on the longer term, we want to uh, work on the 64-bit version of the STM and a cross-trigger interface driver. I feel I'm out of time and it's perfect timing. So questions for Al and myself. Yes. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on what kind of metadata you plan on supporting. You mentioned something about that on a few slides ago. Um, do you plan to support uh, providing, for example, the names of the binary images that are running while trace is enabled, or are you referring to something else when you use the term metadata? We use the term metadata uh, here in the context of everything that we require to properly decode the traces. Uh, off system afterwards. So we're talking about the image of the code in memory, right? Uh, the configuration of uh, the trace engine. That's also important because on some version the trace stream does not convey any information as to how the packets are encapsulated. And uh, production of the packet and their format will also vary on depending on the configuration that the engine has. Um, Al talked about context ID and virtual machine ID. Those are also things that have to go into the metadata. So we need to carry all the information uh, that will be required to properly decode the trace data. So I was wondering how far you might put that. How far? Right now, there's, there's uh, a document has been written and published. Uh, you'll find that in the presentation that I have uh, done for Linero, and they're also in the, uh, the reference section. Al wrote that. Uh, so there's, there's a, that document starting to standardize or actually highlight 
what needs to be collected in the format that has to be collected. Other than that, uh, on here we have uh, the uh, basic configuration of how the trace entity has been configured that can be gathered and moved to um, a Python script, for instance, that would uh, help uh, a decoder finding the information that it needs. Other than that, we haven't done anything yet. Just because to get there, we need to have a foundation. And this is the foundation that we're trying to introduce here. Right? As soon as we have a foundation, we hope that people will start you know, adding tools, adding or helping uh, in making this thing better. Can I use that? Absolutely. Yeah, I should say that apart from the, the very specific information about the configuration of the core site devices, most of this metadata is not specific to core site. It's specific, it, it's, it's needed by anything that wants to associate a PC sample, a program counter sample, with a meaningful piece of software. So anything that takes a PC sample needs to know what piece of source it came from, whether it was dynamically generated, what address space it was from, um, you know, things like JIT, self-modifying code, loadable kernel modules all create problems there. So we see the solution to capturing that information as being architecture independent. So we're really looking for that problem to be solved in, in it, through things like PERF and other trace mechanisms. Could be LTTG, LTMG, um, CTF. But the, the amount of metadata we need that's specific to core site is only really a very, very small amount. Any other questions on core site? Uh, just remember we have a panel in 30 minutes to talk about uh, how we can improve uh, interfaces in Linux for hardware tracing. So we can keep those for the panel if you have something for core site. Maybe this question uh, comes with this one, but if I understand it correctly, then the data coming out of this is binary data, which for no tool is available to decode it. So can you use uh, existing debuggers, for example, uh, those from ARM themselves, right. to uh, decode that raw data? So right now there's, there's multiple tools that will actually do it. Uh, DS5 will do that for you. The Lauder back will do that for you. Uh, no problem. Uh, TI also has a, a decoding tool in their uh, Code Composer Studio uh, that will decode trace data for their processor. Uh, on the free side, you have um, PTM to human, they will do uh, a fairly good job at extracting the packets. It will not go into what the packets are, but it will just extract the packet and will tell you what the packets are. Um, Arve at Google did a very, very good tool for his own needs, but uh, it could easily be expanded um, and it would provide uh, you know, in trace decoding to the instruction level. Do you want to add something to that? Yeah, I, again, I think we, we, we'd hope that we have a solution that allows us to plug a decoder into some architecture independent tool like LTTNG. We don't want to be building a complete set of ARM specific <coughs> trace viewing tools. We would rather decode the trace to an instruction stream and then feed that into something like LTTNG. So, so this is part of the challenges that we have to address in order to make this technology more ubiquitous and accepted. Hi, my question is um, which reference bots do we if that, uh, how to support? The TC2 is fully enabled right now. Uh, Beagle XM and Beagle Board will also work right off the bat uh, with the patch set that we have. Uh, the other boards that we are working with, uh, the, Qual the Qualcomm uh, Snapdragon 8074 is not finished yet, uh, but it's also coming in. And uh, in the coming months, or sorry, in the coming weeks, uh, the very most will also have support for Juno. So we can uh, continue the discussion in, in, in 30 minutes. Uh, so thank you, uh, Mathieu and Al.